and almost five hundred dollars and i know uh i our family chose to give some more this week so uh, i sure would love to see that get up to a hundred thousand and it might be that that will happen uh, if God leads you to give towards that. Uh, wouldn't that be great to be able to give away $100,000 to missions uh, at the end of this month? We'd love to write those checks and uh, send it out so the gospel could be heard all over the world. Also this week, we were able to pay about $123,000 on our debt because you gave that the first Sunday of this month towards that. So that was a big, nice check we could write to pay on our debt. Uh, we just need uh, probably several hundred more of those. So uh, We're going to talk to you some about that on that night, the vision night we talked about and what we see God is wanting and leading us to do for the future. Um, I just believe that's going to be a great night as all of the staff will be up on the stage and sharing with you in those uh, in that hour. As you, John mentioned earlier, that we I've just been led to speak on the names of Jesus this Christmas season um, because they're so powerful. And one person said there were around seven hundred different names that has been given to our Lord and Savior. I mean, you could take two or three years and preach on that alone, on the names of Jesus. And of course, we can't preach on all of them. Last week, we talked to you about the most popular name that we have, and that's the name Jesus itself. It just simply means that Jehovah saves. And uh, today, I want to look at a passage in Isaiah, where the prophet Isaiah had more to say about the promised Messiah of Israel than any other prophet. In a very point of history spanning at least 64 years, Isaiah, whose name means the salvation of Jehovah, was God's spokesman during the reign of four different kings. And in Isaiah 53, the most popular, probably, chapter in all of Old Testament, it talks about the suffering Savior that was to come. And then over in, in Isaiah 61, and verse 1 through 3, is a popular passage where Jesus said that the Spirit of the Lord is upon him, and he's come to set it free captives and preach the acceptable year of the Lord. So we see by those two passages really uh, a mysterious blend of power and of suffering. And it was saying that he would come to be our suffering servant, but also the powerful Lord that would preach the acceptable year of the Lord. But here in chapter 9, verse 6, he presents the character, the character of this coming servant. Listen to what he says. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. So here he's presenting the character of God. And these names that he says in his name will be called, those names mean something. Hebrew names were always significant. So in this final portion of this verse, the prophet used uh, a miraculous, descriptive set of names to unfold to us the very essence of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Messiah. 
And these four names shape our understanding of God the Messiah. And we're going to deal with one of those names today. And that name is Wonderful Counselor. Wonderful Counselor. Now, what is the meaning of that name? That's an obvious question we would ask. What is the meaning of the name Wonderful Counselor? Well, the name literally translated means this, a wonder of a counselor. A wonder of a counselor. Boy, that's a great description of that name. I want you to look at it in two parts. First of all, let's look at wonderful. What does wonderful mean? Well, it means something uncommon or out of the ordinary. And it really reflects a phenomenon lying outside the realm of any human explanation. We just cannot explain it. Matter of fact, the word is used in Psalms 139 and 6, and it says this, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too high. I cannot attain it. How can you explain the wonder of who he is? He's beyond human explanation. I believe sometimes we've weakened the view of the miraculous and therefore in doing that have limited a sense of wonder that uh, we have. Let me just explain what I'm talking about. A football team comes back after what seems an impossible feat to win the game. And we will say, man, that was a miracle. Or maybe we have, especially for you younger ones, have an exam that uh, you had to take and you were pretty sure you blew it. But when you got the paper, it said A+. Plus. And you said, man, that was a miracle, you know. Or maybe I get out on the golf course and I hit a hole in one. And I would say, man, that's a miracle. That would be probably as close to a miracle as anything I know of. But we have trivialized that word. To the human level but really a real wonder is something beyond human explanation I'm looking at a man right now sitting about middle ways of this sanctuary that the doctors didn't give him very long to live but he's sitting here healthy doing the things he wants to do And God healed him. Now that's a miracle. That's beyond human explanation. That's beyond what the doctor could even think or say. God healed him. Brian, that's a miracle, isn't it, buddy? God brought a miracle in your life. Only God can do that. I saw him. He looked like he was going to die any day. But to see what God did. I'm telling you, God's still in the miracle working business. And he's still a wonder, isn't he? Isn't he still a wonder? Only he can do some things that's beyond human comprehension. So the prophet Isaiah declared that the coming child and son would be a wonder. And this not only describes what he did, but who he is. He is. He is God Almighty. I pray we see him that way. He is a wonder. Amen? But he's counselor as well. The second part of this description of the coming Messiah is that he is a counselor. The Hebrew usage of this word is used to picture a king Given counsel to his people. 
good example as Micah declared the dilemma of the captives that were in Babylon. And he described it this way. Now why do you cry aloud, he said? Is there no king in your midst? Has your counselor perished? You see, back in biblical days, the king of Israel was not only someone who ruled over them, but he was their counselor who would counsel them in the ways of God. He was not a prophet that would preach the word of God, but he was a counselor. He was to be over them, to rule over them, and to teach them and to act out the ways of God. Now we know that God never wanted them to have a king in the first place. He wanted to be the only king in their lives that would rule over them. But because they wanted that, he gave them what they wanted. Now, we know that all those kings were flawed. Now, there were some good kings, but there were some wicked kings that did not follow the way of the Lord. But he was to be a counselor for the nation of Israel. Listen, long before the king was ever born, long before the son was ever given, Isaiah foretold that God was planning to send a counselor for the brokenhearted people of the world. And since Jesus has entered into the world, we can see that he lived out the kind of counsel that Isaiah told about in the last days. Listen to what Isaiah would say about this counsel. Isaiah 2, 3, he will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. Isaiah 11, 2, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom, and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. Then he said in Isaiah 28, 29, this all comes from the Lord of hosts, who is wonderful, above human explanation, wonderful in counsel, and excellent in guidance. That's what he prophesied of him. That's the kind of wonderful counselor he would be. So we have the meaning of what that name means. Now what is the evidence that Jesus is that wonderful counselor? That is for us who live on this side of the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. You and I can see the meaning and the evidence of this great, mighty, wonderful counselor. We can see them fleshed out in person in the Gospels of the Lord Jesus. And we can read and reflect and call out for help from the one who became for us the wisdom from God, as Paul says. Listen, when you and I take all that we know about Christ, it adds up to a marvelous truth that he is the God who is and who is called a wonderful counselor. It all adds up. He is God with us. When we see his wonder, listen, if a wonder is anything that causes amazement, then it describes everything about the one who came to fulfill Isaiah's prophecy. I want you to listen to what Timothy 
Paul told Timothy, to his young pastor, he said, and without controversy, I want you to note that again, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in flesh. He was justified in the spirit. He was seen by angels, and he was preached among the Gentiles and believed on in the world, and he was received up to glory. Paul is telling young Timothy that this wonderful counselor was made flesh and was seen by angels and was preached to the Gentiles. He was the coming Messiah. This wonderful wonder disturbs the skeptics of our day. They can't explain him. They may accept some of his teachings that accommodates them and they may accept the good teachings of the goodness of God, but they reject the justice and judgment of God that even Jesus himself spoke of. They're skeptical of our Lord and Savior. But I want to tell you this, Jesus, comforts the heart of the brokenhearted. Amen? He does that, and he delights the soul of the beggars that we all are. He delights our soul, and it speaks of our hero of heaven who would gather little children unto him and say, such is the kingdom of God. And he would say to us, you must come as these little children to inherit the kingdom. He is the Son of God who offers to bring people of all nations to his Father and invites all who trust him to be a part of his forever family. That's why he's so wonderful. Listen, what he, in his work of redemption for us, did is beyond comprehension. You and I never can comprehend but we can enjoy for all eternity the wondering and worshiping and loving relationship with our Creator God, the Son of Heaven, who became sin for us. I can't comprehend fully what God did for us. I can't comprehend the love that He has. It's beyond my comprehension. It's beyond my understanding. It's beyond my explanation of what God did for us. You and I don't deserve it. I remember years ago hearing an illustration that just has stuck in my mind for all these years. There was a gentleman who ran and operated a bridge for a, a train to go across a mighty river. And it was a swing bridge, much like the one down here at the beach. And one day he took his young boy with him to work. And while the br bridge was turned across the river. The little boy got away from his father and began to play around down below the bridge. And he got down close to the gears that turns the bridge. 
And the father noticed an ongoing train coming his way. And he had to turn the bridge so that the train could get across. And he looked down. As he looked down, he noticed that his son was right in the midst of the gears that turned the bridge. And he had a mighty big decision to make. Either his son to die so that all on that train could live or save his son and allow those people to die. And in the final moment, he determined that he must save the lives of those people and he turned the, the bridge and his son was killed. And as he, the train passed by and he saw the faces of the people, he cried out as loud, with a loud voice, Do you understand what I did for you to save your life? That's what God did for us. You and I were headed to destruction. But the blessed Son of God allowed his own son to die so that you and I could live. I can't understand that. Can you? I cannot understand it. But that's what God did for us. That's wonder of wonders. Amen? That's wonders of wonders. And he did all of this and allowed himself to die for our sin so that you and I could live. And he invites all of us to trust him. Everything about him, I think, should stir our heart with wonder and with submission to him. But notice something else about his counsel. Even as a child, at 12, Jesus astonished the rabbis with his wisdom. They couldn't understand how a young child could be so wise at that age. Luke recorded that the child grew and became strong in spirit and filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And in his public life, people were amazed at the truthfulness of his counsel. And when he had come to his own country, he taught them in their, their synagogues so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? They said, is he not Joseph's son? Where did he get this wisdom, this understanding? Later on, Paul wrote that in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and of knowledge. I want you to ask yourself, are you as astonished at the wonder of a counselor as, I, as Isaiah was? Are you and I captivated by his insight and by his practical wisdom? I've been reading for the last several weeks in the Gospels, in my quiet time. And I've been amazed that some of the wisdom that he spoke, at times when they sought to trap him, and he would just have such wisdom that it would silence them completely. They had no way of coming back because of his wisdom. Listen, where else can you go to learn how to love. God showed us how to love through His Son. He gave us wisdom beyond our understanding on how you and I can even love our enemies. We didn't learn that by from our mothers or fathers or from our teachers on this earth. We learned that from God. 
Where else can you learn how to cry? Jesus taught us how to weep over those that are in sorrow. Where else can you go to learn how to live? And then how to die. I've been around the bedside of many of people. And I've watched them drawing their last breath, raising their hands to, to the glory of God. And I've heard them whisper into my ear, LeBron, I'm so excited about what I'm going to face here in the next few moments. I was with someone this week that come to the resolve that said to me, I'm going to be okay. If the Lord wants me to live on for several more months or for years, that's okay. But Pastor, I know where I'm going. And if he takes me any time, I'm ready to go. I know where I'm going to spend eternity. But I've been by the bedside of people that had no hope. And I've watched them in their stubbornness die in their uncertainty about their future. God taught us how to die. He taught us by the way he died. Where else can you go? Where else can you be assured of the acceptance and the forgiveness and the comfort of God other than through the counsel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Where else can we look into the face that is the face of our Creator and our Savior and Lord and our Counselor? You cannot go anywhere else but to the Lord Jesus. And you can see it. As he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But last of all, what is the importance of the name wonderful counselor to us as believers today how does he give us help how does he impart his wisdom to us and how do you and i seek that wisdom listen we don't go to him like we go to a fortune teller or to a, a spiritual medium because our wonderful counselor whom isaiah predicted is also our creator and our Savior. He's not just anyone. He is the fulfillment of all that both the Old and the New Testament teaches. His counsel is found wherever you can find the words and provision of God. In the Old Testament, it is His story. In the New Testament, Gospels are the record of His conversation with people of His day. The letters of the rest of the New Testament represents the practical application of his teaching to life. We find his counsel in the Sermon on the Mount and his conversation with the inner three, Peter, James, and John. We find his teachings and wisdom in the letters of the Apostle Paul in all of our, all of this, our wonderful counselor is urging us to let him bring us to the Father. That's his intent, is to bring us to the Father. And he offers himself as the sacrifice for our own sin and the basis of our acceptance with God. You and I would never have acceptance with him if our wonderful counselor had not offered himself as our sacrifice so that you and I could come into the very presence of God. I believe one day when we stand before God, he's going to be our advocate that will stand up and say, Father, this one 
was saved by my faith in him. We'll be accepted because of that. He offers us to be for us everything we need for this life. Everything we need for this life. And not only in this life, but the life to come. He was not just telling us what we want to hear when he assured us by these sayings. Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. God knows all the things that you and I need. Everything that we need. And he will give us all things that we need if we put him first in our life. I want to tell you, this wonderful counselor is everything you and I need in life. That's what he's saying in those verses. Now, how does that wonderful counselor help us with all these problems that you and I face? And how does he lead us? to a place of security and satisfaction and enjoyment. Where, how does he do that? Well, he does it through his word, through his word and through prayer. Psalms 118.24 says, Your testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. Your word is my counselor. He does it by reminding us there's safety in a multitude of good counselors. The Bible teaches us that in Proverbs 11, 14. I'm glad I've got you and you and you and you and you as my counselors. And many of you have spoken into my life and helped me in decision making. Not necessarily of saying, Pastor, this is what you should do, but sometimes you help me make decisions by words of encouragement. And often I've come to you and asked, what do you think I should do? I remember when we decided to build this building, I pulled several business, businessmen in our church together and asked them about their wisdom, about how they move forward in their business to make it prosperous. And just use some, ask them to give me some principles that could help me in making a decision whether or not we should build this building. I remember that very vividly. And they gave me some good words of counsel. There's wisdom in that. God gave us great counsel. But most of all, he does so with the assurance that because of who he is, he can help us in ways that go far beyond our ability to understand. He says in Psalms 32, 8, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. I personally believe that he's talking about the Holy Spirit here. Jesus said to his disciples that after he left them, that another comforter would come that would guide them into all truth. Aren't you glad that our wonderful counselor's ability to help goes far beyond the limited help that we are able to offer or anyone else? Amen? It goes far beyond that. And aren't you thankful for the wonderful counselor that Isaiah spoke of. And aren't you glad he's got him in your heart to counsel you and guide you on your way, whatever your decision is. 
that you need to make. Everything that you need to know about in life is in this book. And the way you find out is you read it, then you ask God to give you wisdom to understand it. And the Holy Spirit will guide you how you should go. I'll never forget that cold night in January in 1959, January the 3rd, when I heard my wonderful counselor speak to me for the very first time. And I can remember turning to my mom as if to say, Mom, what should I do? But just as quick as I turned to look at my mom, I knew in my heart, Mom couldn't give me the answer. But I knew where the answer was. And I made my way down an aisle and got on my knees in an old-fashioned altar. And I called out to my wonderful counselor, and ask him to save me that night. Some wonderful Christian knelt by me and read me the counsel of God and said, LeBron, if you'll believe that Jesus died for you on the cross, and that he rose again on the third day, and if you'll confess your sin, and ask him to save you, he will save you. Well, I want to tell you, I accepted that counsel that night, and I believed in it, and I trusted it. And he said, if you acknowledge that you believe that, would you stand up as an act of a testimony that you accept what Jesus did for you? I stood up that day, and I want to tell you the joy of the Lord filled this little heart of mine at 10 years old. And I wanted to hug everybody in that room. I've never known of a 10-year-old boy that wants to hug anybody. But God put it in my heart. The joy of the Lord. And I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. He became my wonderful counselor that day and has been all these years. I wish I could say I followed every one of his ways. But it didn't take long when I got away from his counsel that his sweet Holy Spirit did prick my heart and said, you tell me, LeBron, that was not a wise choice. But he would point me to the right way. And I want to tell you his counsel worked. It works. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding, but acknowledge him in all your ways. And he promised you, I will direct your path. He's a wonderful counselor. Amen? Maybe you don't know him as your personal Savior today. Maybe today, you want to trust him as your Savior and Lord. Could be you're an older person who reject him for many years, but today God stands to you. Accept my counsel. Come to me, and I'll give you life. Maybe you're a young person that God is speaking to for the first time and saying, I want you to accept me as your Lord and Savior. Would you come? Maybe this is where God wants you to join. He's counseling you that this is the place. The Spirit of God speaking to you. This is the place that you need to be a part of to serve the Lord. Maybe there's some other decisions in your life, some major decisions you need to make, and you need to just come and kneel at this altar and say, God, help me make the right decision. Give me what I need to know. I guarantee you. He will tell you what to do. Would you stand with us as we sing? You come right now. I need thee every hour, most gracious. 
us, Lord. No tender voice like thine can be soft for. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. Can I just say a word to young people in this church I want to tell you that the greatest thing you could ever do in your life 